Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. I am Judy Mam, co-founder of Dada. Uh, we are a social network where people speak to each other through drawings, creating spontaneous visual conversations. We're really happy to be here. Uh, this is the second time we participate in this conference. And I will be moderating this presentation and conversation about our paper, which is called The Invisible Economy. I'm going to introduce our fabulous panelists. And then Beatriz uh, Ramos, who is the founder of Dada, will present uh, the paper, and then we're going to have a conversation about it. So to present our panelists, Beatriz Elena Ramos is an artist, a social anarchist, tech entrepreneur, and the founder of Dada.art, and she is the author of the paper we are here to discuss. Dada is using blockchain technology to create a new economic paradigm for artists in which art making is separated from art sale transactions, allowing artists to create and experiment freely while they receive a passive income for their contribution to the community. Michael Albert is a founder and current member of the staff of Z Magazine, as well as Z Magazine's web system, Z Communications, including Znet. Michael has been a radical since the 1960s, and he is the author of over 20 books, including Fanfare for the Future, Remembering Tomorrow, Realizing Hope, Paracon, Life After Capitalism, which uh, we are indebted to in our model, and we'll talk about it as well, and Practical Utopia. Many of Albert's articles are stored in Zcom and can be accessed there, and you can also find his presentations on YouTube. Primavera de Filippi is a permanent researcher at the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris, a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, and a visiting fellow at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. She's a member of the Global Future Council on Blockchain Technologies at the World Economic Forum and co-founder of the Internet Governance Forum Dynamic Coalitions on Blockchain Technology. Her fields of interest focus on legal challenges raised by decentralized technologies. She's investigating the new opportunities for these technologies to enable new governance models and participatory uh, decision making through the concept of governance by design. Her book, Blockchain and the Law, was published in 2018 by Harvard University Press, co-authored with Aaron Wright. Thanks for uh, joining us, Michael and Primavera. And Lenara Verl is an artist and researcher. Her current research focuses on conceptual art in connection with alternative economies and currency design. She has taught several graduate and undergraduate classes, as well as independent workshops on the topic of art technology and collaboration, and she consults for a blockchain art platforms and is a founder of coinspiration.org. So welcome everyone, and um, uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Bea talk to us about the invisible economy. Unmute yourself, Bea. Hi. So I'm trying to share my screen. Do you guys see it? Now? Okay, great. All right. So um, you know, spent two years working on this uh, economic model, and I'm going to try to just do the highlights of 50 pages of the paper in uh, under 10 minutes. Let's see how it goes. Um, so Dada is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a social network where people speak to each other through drawings. And uh, the community have created over 120,000 drawings on the platform. And the challenge that we set up to solve is how you make sustainable um, a community that is uh, incentivized to do the, what they're doing for intrinsic motivations and that is ruled by social norms. How you do that without undermining the very, the very uh, reasons why they contribute. And we think that the invisible economy is the answer to that. <clears throat> so let's look at some data about art. 98% of art students quit after graduation. Um, less than 1% of artists can leave of their work. Um, Galleries last year on the art market uh, reported that 64% of their sales were by the three top artists with 42% uh, just by one artist. And in the US, uh, the representation, it's, it's really uh, bad in terms of percentages. Most is, uh, is white people and men. 
African Americans have only 1.2% of representation. So the question that we ask is how come after the unprecedented democratization of art and creativity, now everyone has access to uh, all kinds of tools for fundraising, production and distribution, reaching audiences, how come art continues to be elitist and unsustainable? And we think the answer to that is that uh, although there has been enormous innovation in terms of technology, there's not really any innovation in terms of economic models. And so some of the problems that we um, have identified is, uh, of course, the biggest problem that we have in society right now is the extreme inequality markets produce. There is this belief in meritocracy, but meritocracy is a fallacy in a, when it coexists with extreme inequality and where unfair advantages like wealth, uh, gender, or even talent uh, disproportionately benefit some people over others. The actual reason why they, uh, these superstars that we see today exist is because of the uh, winner take all markets, also called star systems, that produce a top few top people on, uh, that, that reaps all the rewards and a long tail of people who tried and failed um, to, to get to the top. This is because of the reinforcements, the reinforcement of um, feedback loops. So one thing that we know is that transfer, like poverty happens when uh, the source of wealth are transfers from some people to other people. I see copyright with all the problems that it has as, a no, as a, also as a way of transferring uh, the source of wealth in, in which for artists is the intellectual property into the hands of, let's say, companies, stakeholders uh, through copyrights. And another way of doing this is uh, on the secondary markets, for instance, when artists sell artwork, they don't get royalties. And so that's uh, one big problem for art. The other thing is that uh, in this world today, everything is for sale. When it comes to art, art is com com commodified, but not only commodified, it's uh, also financially side. So uh, art becomes an, an, another asset class that uh, can generate capital gains, just like real estate of stocks. So it becomes another way for the rich to transfer wealth and, and uh, move capital around. So then, Private property, which is an, an interesting um, finding because uh, the extreme inequality we see today is actually not driven by divergence in salaries, even though of the, you know, we have these egregious uh, star systems. It is actually driven by uh, unequal ownership of capital and the capital is not productive capital that uh, brings about jobs and, and, and more egalitarian society, but it's unproductive capital that comes from the sales of real estate and stocks and luxury goods like art that are bought cheaply and then sold for profit. So when you have all of that, uh, how can we tackle or subvert uh, some of these uh, effects of the markets? And so our thesis is that information networks are now the most uh, the, the, the more powerful way of creating wealth uh, today. So think about Amazon, Google, Facebook. And so we think that if we, data is in itself an information network and can benefit from network effects and grow to billions of people. So we think that if we take uh, this information network and we issue our own money, then we're basically co-opting two of the, mo of the most uh, powerful social institutions of today. And so the way we can do that is through blockchain technology, which allows for the creation of token economies, uh, which means that you issue your own currency and peer-to-peer -peer networks can actually um, self-manage their own business model. So it replace the central authority and, it, and, and the decision-making goes into the network. 
But if I believe that if we don't think about new economic models, if we just use the same economic models, then we're just going to repeat the same uh, results. We've already seen that with uh, Bitcoin and others. So what we're thinking is Wikipedia is an interesting case because they demonstrated that an information network could actually leverage the wisdom of the cloud without um, the pernicious effects of the market, just based on uh, altruism and, and autonomy and sense of belonging. And it actually demonstrated that it could be more efficient at the market by killing Encarta, which was the encyclopedia by Microsoft, um, which was the most powerful company at the time. So what we think uh, the invisible economy can do is to make a way of an information network like Wikipedia or Dada to be sustainable without depending on donations, like we, in the case of Wikipedia or traditional models. So the way we do this is by completely separating, radically separating the art making on the platform from the market. And this means artists won't be able to decide the price of their art, but the bidders won't be able to see what other bidders are uh, you know, buying stuff for. We won't put prices of anything. Uh, completely, it will be completely invisible. And um, blockchain allows for, for this to be really invisible in the sense that we can hide a lot of the transaction from the mechanics uh, using different uh, mechanics. But uh, it's also, it makes it possible to be transparent because everything is gonna be immutably on all the transactions immutably on the blockchain and anyone can trace them <clears throat> back to their origin uh, on, on, on the ledger. So, when you think about that, uh, then it becomes all about incentives. Uh, economy is all about incentives and, and what we really have to think, I think where, where most projects fail is in incentives. There is this belief that uh, money is a universal incentive for everything. And uh, so we thought a lot about this and created this incentive framework in which the two values of, uh, of the invisible economy are the two intersecting access, uh, which are needs and motivations, the need for individual freedom and the need for a community, as well as the vertical axis, which is um, the motivations, the uh, balance between intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. And it has eight core drivers that overlap through the, through the system. So there's always these questions about freedom versus uh, fairness. And we believe, you know, the, the systems that can be, that they don't have to be mutually, mutually, mutually exclusive. There are systems where people can uh, self-direct, uh, be, develop their talents and, and do that in, in uh, it put this into into social account, um, and you know, Paricom is one one example. We can talk about it with uh, Michael. And then uh, the thing about incentives is that incentives are what motivates us and uh, to act on on our beliefs. And uh, fifty years of research have demonstrated that. Uh, you know, we have intrinsic incentive, in, in, uh, incentive, incentives, which is our love for something, for art, our urge to help each other, uh, our need for community. Um, and we also have extrinsic uh, incentives, which are imposed by the outside. And we do them because we want to get something in return, like money or an award um, or deadlines that we have to meet. Um, but what is interesting is that research has shown that once you replace the intrinsic motivations, just doing an activity because the activity in itself is its own reward, then uh, you replace that with extrinsic motivations, then these intrinsic motivations disappear completely. So 
this is uh, one of the insights of uh, this economy because that means that um, this is the reason why uh, the, the entire economy has to be invisible since we're talking about artists and about creating art. So the way we, when you go into the, the uh, axis, uh, the way it works is we start with the minimum material baseline people need in order to actually pursue their self-development and their self-actualization. No one can um, pursue that if they don't know how to put money, you know, food into the table or to, how, how they're gonna pay the rent. So the minimum they need. And then to be able to actually uh, go and, and pursue higher spiritual um, aims. On the other side, we, we take from Ubuntu, who is, uh, which is an uh, African philosophy that I learned from Primavera, um, that is a beautiful thing because they promote the, the good of the community through the unconditional recognition of individual di the, uh, uniqueness and, uh, and, um, and difference. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, thing. And so on the other side, what we aim is to create uh, interdependence, which, in which people are autonomous uh, you know, in, in regards of, of each other, but they are interrelated through the entire system. This creates synergies. All right, so the eight uh, basic uh, core drivers are basic income and here, um, this we owe to Michael Albert um, to make sure the system doesn't reproduce star systems and inequality and it doesn't, uh, that doesn't um, favor some fair uh, advantages. Basic income is only gonna be rewarded by effort. So not, not talent, no outcomes, just effort. Validation. Um, we data already provides a support system for artists to be uh, collaborating with each other for their art to be seen and encouraged and, and, and appreciated in a way that there is, they're not influencers, there is no rankings, there is no reputation systems, it's completely open and anyone have the same, uh, the same uh, opportunity in there. So, one of the things that is important uh, in the blockchain uh, decentralized world is that people think that autonomy is, for artists means radical disintermediation. So you have now the, the possibility to sell your own work, choose your platform, negotiate directly to, um, to collectors. But uh, research shows that when there is a, we behave different and we have different expectations when uh, we make art <clears throat> for our own uh, our own necessities uh, <clears throat> for the love of it. Then, when we make art with the intention of selling it, and so our minds changing changes from uh, an ethical framework, let's say, to an economic uh, calculation, from market norms to social norms, and so what we aim to. Uh, maintain is the social norms. For us, autonomy is actually the freedom to explore artistic such expression without any constraints of any kind. And so self-expression is for, for us, uh, the way artists achieve a self um, actualization is through the artistic process. So the invisible economy encourages that. When that drive is liberated, people actually live healthier, uh, richer lives. And uh, the great and good of art in itself, it's, uh, it, it's a powerful uh, way of, uh, of having communities be cohesive, for people to feel safe. This was something I was doing after uh, Soho was looted. People just, it, it brings people together. It also speaks truth to power. When art is financialized the way it is today, it limits that power. So we aim to, to actually liberate it. And so this, I'm not gonna get into the technical stuff, but uh, we think 
we are about to see a exponential creative uh, of explosion of, of creative uh, collaboration because blockchain technology allows for digital art for the first time to be scarce and have ownership. And so for us, what is uh, great about this is that now we can value art not for its scarcity, but for its abundance, meaning that for us, it's not the scarcity what is that, that, that uh, blockchain creates. It's not the digital scarcity what is important. It's actually the fact that attribution is always tied to this digital asset. So now anyone can collaborate on top of anyone's art and the value that is added can be tracked so that everyone um, can benefit from the value that they're all creating. So it, it's a way of for art to just evolve freely in, in many uh, different unexpected ways. See, okay, so interdependence uh, creates, you know, we, we, we're more empathic to, to people that we know, our friends, our family, our colleagues. And so what we aim to create through our self-governance system is uh, to create trust between people and not just connectivity, but trust. And that trust will uh, make the whole ecosystem be uh, interdependent. And the everything, the code and all the art, the art is made on the platform, nothing is uploaded. So everything will be owned by the community. Uh, so we'll call it the commons and um, we are actually, because we have the opportunity to create from scratch this uh, economic system, we are proposing to separate the uh, functions of money and use drawings actually as the medium of exchange. So when you think about that, then you have new ways of uh, valuing and transferring uh, the, that value of art comes to mind. For instance, artists could uh, pay with uh, a drawing and add a symbolic or artistic uh, value on top of economic value that could, for example, pay Primavera for something and make a portrait of her, for instance. So we call it uh, a way of transferring value with meaning. And uh, finally, I think what is incredible about imagine a new way of transferring value is that art in itself has value and can be captured in the value of the network. The, in other words, if people find the network valuable, the token will raise in value. And so art doesn't really need to be commoditized. Come for the first time, think about art in a way that is not financialized. And we can actually think about um, an art movement and the force and the cultural significance and historic significance of an art movement being encapsulated through uh, the value of this token. So thank you very much. I'm excited to talk to the three of you. You are the only ones that we actually um, acknowledge in our paper as the people who contributed to all these uh, ideas uh, through our conversations. And um, I'm, um, I'm actually more interested in your thoughts. I'm here to answer questions, but I want uh, to hear your thoughts. So we can start by, uh, let's say. And also, just let me say, so if the audience has any questions, please uh, share them. And uh, we will also make it, make them known to, to the panelists. Um, yeah. I think that, uh, well, before, you know, e each one of these guys in their field of expertise may, has a, you know a, a way of of uh, seeing this and and so uh, uh i don't know if we we want to start with primavera perhaps well what, what i would love to what i would love to know is uh first for each of you what is the most interesting thing that you find about this proposal and uh, also some of your concern i don't know who wants to start what about michael well, I guess my concern is that I don't really understand it. Uh, so it's very hard to render an opinion or, or 
a suggestion or anything uh, without feeling like, am I saying anything that's even remotely relevant? Um, I, I just... Is the technology, the, the, the blockchain part? Well, I certainly don't understand that. I mean, I will admit straight up, I don't, I don't get blockchain. I don't understand it. And, uh, but it's, it's more basic than that. I think you're, you're creating a community of artists, right? And the artists are contributing their work. And I get that they can also adapt and, and work off each other's work. And, uh, and then you want an economic component of this and the economic component of it, I get, I think, that you want to avoid many of the familiar horrible attributes of market exchange and competition and uh, um, you know distorting incentives and so on. I get that. But I don't understand exactly what is being proposed in its place. So make believe I'm an artist and I come in and I, draw, and I create something. Now what? Right? I, I, I don't, listening, I don't, I don't know. So what is it that happens with what I'm doing and what is the economic dimension of it as well as the artistic dimension of it? I don't, I don't get it. Okay. I, I, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so the, uh, if I'm an artist, I will continue to do what they already do, in a, which is create art without any pressure to produce a specific outcome. The only difference is that now they don't get any economic value uh, back. So the way we're going to do that is they continue to do whatever they're doing. And all of that transactional part is going to happen in the background. So imagine just like the way we use emails, you send an email, well, they make drawings, they will get a basic income based on our gamified system and all of that, but they will get money uh in in return right this comes from the sales of uh, some of the art licensing it comes from the actual value of the token if the token raises in value then that that's really the interesting part then the rewards go to the community so, so the idea is a lot of people are producing art there's some mechanism that's um selling that art to people who want it Mm -hmm. The money is sort of accumulated and then it's dispersed among all those artists, not according to how much they did or how many artworks they did or even how much their particular piece of art was loved. Exactly. But just by virtue of their effort, the, the fact that they put in time and energy and, and worked and then they all get some income. Yes. Okay. I understand that too now. I like that. But um but I, is, is the sale, you're still interfacing with the usual art market. Yep. In other words, right? The, 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 where the where the income is coming from, which ultimately we artists are going to get to share, yep. is the sale of the art on the, on the market, on the art well, market. I, I think in the beginning, yes. There is a, we are in a very new emerging, because we're pioneers in this blockchain uh, space there is a new completely new market that is forming so initially yes we can sell digital art but i i believe there is a way through the token to get to a point in which that wouldn't be even necessary and that's you know a longer a longer uh vision but primavera do you do you have anything to add about that yeah, I have a uh, lot of things, but I will try to be very succinct. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I absolutely loved the paper and I loved it even further because I've read it while I was writing or um, drafting uh, a preliminary version of a chapter on a social credit system. And the chapter I was preparing was on the utopia which is which which i found very challenging because i i see a very dystopian thing about social credits um but this chapter was about utopian so i was like working myself out to try to envision an utopian vision of society using the social credit and it was just marvelous reading this paper and realizing we were completely aligned um <laughs> the question of intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, motivation and um 
And I find it uh, very interesting because I think like this is the problem the the, the market economy, the deep economy have exactly the same problem, which is that everything is objective and quantified. And um, the tasks that we do are determined by the rewards that people provide us. And that's extremely reductive. And, and it's even more reductive in the social credit than in the market, but it's very reductive in the sense that those extrinsic rewards will are, have pre-established activities that will be rewarded and pre-established activity that will be discouraged, um, that will be sanctioned. And, um, and this doesn't give any way for exploration of other ways to produce value and so forth. So uh, on the positive side, I, I absolutely love the, the idea of working on gamification, not with like quantification, scoring and all this stuff, but rather uh, using more intrinsic and therefore, um, I would say, inherently qualitative metrics, mm -hmm. right? Now, on the, on the criticism, if I may. Um, <laughs> so the thing is that, so the invisible economy, I think the invisibility of the economy is, is essential in the sense that if you know what are the metrics, then the metrics will become the thing that you're um, Amen. on. Right? Uh, so it's important that it's invisible. At the same time, my concern uh, is that I find it concerning that me as an artist, I'm doing stuff. I don't really know what I'm doing that is right and wrong, but there is some kind of metrics somewhere that is decided by, in this case, Dada, um, which I'm not aware of. And so in some way, it's kind of the same as like Facebook having its own newsfeed algorithm which no one knows how it works and because because you don't want them to cheat but of course it also means that you can manipulate it as you want so my my insights so i'm gonna share one of my insights from my research about utopian social credit which perhaps will be also useful in um mm -hmm. in this context and it's um it's really about like to me like the essential thing is like the subjectivization and the subjectivization implies that there should be no top-down entity that is actually dictating the rules, that is dictating what qualifies as good or bad, or what is what is what qualifies as effort or not effort, whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and instead, it needs to be inherently peer-to-peer. -peer. And that's also how you get a more democratic uh, assessment of what is the value that I'm providing to the community. Right, so if I have one operator that says X, Y, Z, even if it's not this starting the behavior, it's, it's objective. It's objective by this, well, it's, it's in the subjectivity of this operator, sovereign operator. And to me, the, the way I'm envisioning a, a positive version of uh, scoring and gamification in, in, the, in the social credit system, but potentially also in this, in this model is that the value that I'm contributing needs to be assessed by my peers. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, to me, like um, I was discussing this actually with some people this morning, like how do you, like instead of points and instead of like, because in here in, in the paper, you say that people earn points, right? Right now, but, currently, yes. Right. So I still have points and I can still compare my points with other people, you know, and it's still, it's still, even though it's not a ranking, it's still enabled ranking. It's still create like this kind of leaderboard. And what I was thinking and which would be very cool is like, how do we actually completely get rid of numbers? Mm -hmm. And instead, how do we show the value of the individual through a network visual, right? As in like how, oh, who cool. from the network consider this person to be providing value. And so you can visualize like the, the social network and you can see the people that are more relevant in a particular type of community. And, and then another very interesting thing is like, uh, you know those uh, radial graph? Mm -hmm. You see how they look like? Like you have different, you have different lines and at the end of every line you have a, you have a value, a parameters, and then you create those weird shapes depending on how much in the value you, you get. Mm -hmm. And they do that often for countries and all the different variables. And it's very interesting because 
no one has ever all of them, of course. Right, you, exactly. You have some. And so you can, you can actually evaluate the value, the different values that individuals are contributing to the network, whether it's the amount of time that they have put, whether it's the quality, whether it's like how much people have responded to those, you know, like you can create a lot of different parameters. And then you have like those shapes and you can compare those shapes, but you cannot rank those shapes because one is never better than the other. It's just that people exactly. are providing different type of value. And I find that in that model, or like, I mean, I don't know exactly what the right answer is, you know, but to me, like, we really need like, and this is still quantification because I can see my goal, of course, is to fulfill or even just visualizing that I'm, I'm fulfilling a lot on this side, but very little on this line, then it's going to motivate me to go further on this or maybe to specialize on that, mm -hmm. you know? But so to me, like to, to summarize, I think one, one very important thing is evaluation of the contribution and therefore of the value uh, values provided by the person, by every contributor should be down. And secondly, it should never become a number. It should, we should figure out other ways of visualizing the value contributed uh, in ways that provide valuable information but cannot be compared. Because if you start comparing, you start ranking and you start creating competitive dynamics. Because if I get benefits because I have higher things than you, then I'm not going to collaborate for you to also get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, yeah. So that's... No, that's, that's a it's amazing. No, the, 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 I would say two things. One is that we, we wrote the paper and we're putting it out there for the community now to decide. We don't want to implement anything anymore, making decisions ourselves. One thing I've learned through the process is that at the end, I'm from Venezuela, but I've lived 20 years in New York. And, you know, at the end, everybody who is in this uh, space is either New York, London, SF, Paris, right? Like we need the voices from other places on the, of, of the world. So we're putting that for the community. But um, the other thing I will say though, is that we started the gamification, like every other gamification, uh, completely extrinsic and badges and points and things like that. And when we realized that that, will, that was undermining the collaboration, we basically made it irrelevant. So it's still there, but nobody cares. And I think the reason why nobody cares is because they're getting so much value in other forms of the collaboration, the, the friendships, the, uh, the, the effort that it takes just to get to one place to another, to one little dot to another, that uh, it becomes irrelevant. So that's also very interesting. It, it is there, but it, nobody cares. I don't know if... Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of questions from the audience that are very interesting. And there's actually a question for Lenara from the audience, which I think okay, uh, right. is great. Uh, from Franny, she would love to hear uh, uh, from Lenara as an artist what she thinks about the value being defined by the effort and not by uh, the talent, reputation, or meaning. Um, and also, while we have Lenara, it would also be great to hear her thoughts on the actual uh, feasibility of the economy. No. Okay. Um, I actually think it's really interesting how you call it the invisible economy. And one thing that Primavera mentioned already is how, okay, you want to hide all these uh, rating systems and everything so people won't gain it. But I think it's importantly, it's connected also to another economy that we are immersed in, in our lives. Uh, and it's also invisible and it's called the gift economy. Mm -hmm. And we don't think about it as an economy, but it's also a way of exchanging things, uh, exchanging values and relationships, like all the characteristics of an economy, uh, but it's not based in numbers at all. It's based on community and gifting because a gift is actually priceless, mm -hmm. right? But uh, we, giving a gift actually feels good to whoever gives is like, uh, you know, the value of generosity and if you just give some, something, if you recently gave something to someone, it probably felt good. If it was, you know, a, a real gift, it wasn't like, a, you know, something you did it for other reasons. <laughs> but, um, and receiving a gift also gives you this feeling of uh, reciprocity. And normally you want to reciprocate the gift if you can't. It's, it's not, a, you know, like a mandatory or anything. It's just something spontaneous. 
but it multiplies the value. If you think about, normally you want to give more than what you receive, you know, you kind of want to give a better gift, uh, reciprocate and, and multiply the value of things. So it's quite an interesting economy because it has no numbers, it's priceless, and it actually multiplies value. And I hope you can do something, you know, in, integrate those values into uh, this invisible economy for data. And I think that's one of the goals you have in mind. And, and the paper is really good and has lots of really interesting uh, sources, you know, to learn from. And there's this new technology of blockchain. How are we, we can do this? That's also a little bit of a, that's kind of my personal uh, inquiry. How do you translate things like that, you know, the, the intrinsic motivations and the give into uh, a smart contract, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think, you know, you have some really good, uh, interesting uh, ideas and it's really key to have the community help design this. And I have to say that the first time when I heard this um, uh, Michael's idea that uh, the reward has to go to effort, uh, I actually like, oh no, wait, are we gonna, what is this effort? It's just like hours of work. So if I just, you know, be in front of my tablet as an artist and I, I draw for X number of hours. So are we creating like a, like a, uh, this, uh, how do you say, like the industrial, you know, system line of assembly line. Mm -hmm. And then, and I thought, no, no, I, I don't want that. But then the way that Bea, and I don't even think that's the way Michael, you know, meant it, but that's what kind of came to my mind. Uh, but the way Bea explained it is not just the number of hours that I, I'm in front of a tablet, you know, making a drawing. I don't think that's what um, she means with effort in this invisible economy. It's not so, so simple as that. And effort is just putting something there, but it's more than just the, uh, a number of hours or maybe some you know skill of expertise or i don't know maybe a number of hours that i went to art school or that i practice so i can make this drawing um so it's, it's a little beyond that so i think that's also something that uh, maybe you need to uh, expand a little bit upon what you mean by this effort right because when she talked to me and then she she said no it's not just uh you know hours drawn but the uh, Maybe you engaged with people, you gave support to a new artist that just joined, uh, or you just uh, spread the word, you know, like uh, got new people to join the community. And, and there's all kinds of uh, quote unquote effort. Ben, and maybe you can, um, sorry, uh, maybe you can um, uh, talk a little bit more in detail because this is a, a couple of questions actually asked. No, about very, how very, how is effort <laughs> defined uh, in very, the paper? Very controversial, yeah. And and it was even for me when Michael proposed. Michael basically said, and you can talk about that, Michael. But you want a very you want a real fair system. Well, it has to be through effort and sacrifice. And so it, it's hard when you you think about art because we are our identities as artists are so uh, aligned with the fact of with our talent. But the reality is that art, it's actually a process. It's not, it, art, the value of art is not in, in, in its outcome, it's in the process. So if we say that we are um, actually um, promoting to do more and more art, to experiment as much as possible, as free as possible, then by its very nature, it's gonna uh, produce some great stuff. But, it, but that is not the point. The point is actually to, to, to go through the, the, the process. So effort will be translated into, into value in the process. And the value of the process is like what Lenara said, it, it could be building the community because it is a collaborative uh, art that is created there. It, it's um, you know, defined value in ways that uh, we can attach that, not to a number, but to a certain uh, measure of, of value that the people uh, uh, in itself can, 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 can make it self-evident. Like if we remember that we have already a, a community and we have a lot of data and, and people that can talk about it. And so if you think about it, if we were to uh, do the rewards based on effort at this moment, the people who have 
uh, contributed the most are not just the people who have made more uh, drawings. There are also people who have been the longest there, who have, you know, they help each other. They do a lot of things outside the platform, actually, and, and uh, through these friendships and all of this. So um, we know instinctively who is creating value and who is creating most value. So I think uh, by knowing that, we can sort of trace trace back and say, well, how you get there? And to start measuring the, you know, the, the important things that get us to, to that value. I don't know if it's not the most too abstract, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. Yes, remember. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to add like, um, in my, in, I, like I agree that I think effort is not the right metric if effort is just like how much time you spend on the platform. One is yeah. way way too gameable, and secondly, like there is like so many different facets that need to be accounted. And and again, I think it would be very interesting if instead of just amalgamating everything into the concept of effort, you will actually um, identify the different values that can be brought. Right. So whether it's like artistic talent, right? I think it's quite fine. That but again, it's it has to be peer to peer, right? Because different taste will provide different evaluation. So what does the community consider to be people that help provide artistic talent? Uh, who are the people that are actually providing more of this kind of like um, sociality to the network that are actually engaging with the conversation that are actually mm -hmm. you know, creating things? So that's like the more social or emotional labor or whatever you want to call it. And so actually identifying all the people that are promoting the, 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 the network at the outside, right? So if you actually, it's not metrics, it's actually like, it's very different from identifying specific metrics that qualify, but it's rather identifying different trajectories right. and then having the community assess for every individual when they are bringing value in one of those trajectories. And the effort is, is not effort. I, I would say it's just like this is the overall contribution of, a, of every individual. It's this, sure. it's this thing, but you don't, by not, like the problem with points is that points are always an amalgamation. Yes. And it's really a very bad a reduction. Yeah. yeah, and I think like it's a pity to just say effort as opposed to actually taking advantage of the fact that there are so many interesting trajectories that could be assessed. And actually, while the economy is invisible, because that's, that's actually the economy that remains invisible, but everything that is not economic should be very visible in Absolutely. my life. Yeah, you know? So we, we've run out of time already, but I, before we go, I want to give a, a chance to uh, Michael to, to talk about that, because I think what, what is interesting about Michael's idea is that it's a way of subverting uh, basically, uh, the inequalities that are produced by, uh, uh, you know, unfair advantages like talent, and the fact that some people can actually develop those talents more than others if they're wealthy. Or... So, Michael, you want to talk about that? Well, what we're talking about is just one part of a of an economy. Clearly, um, it's just a question of um, what share of the social product does each do we each get. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about income, I think. And so mm -hmm. we're talking about what share of the social product does each get. And if you say that that shouldn't be due to profit, due to power, you know, what I can take, I get, um, or due to um, something like having better equipment than somebody mm -hmm. else. I shouldn't get more just because I'm lucky enough to have better equipment. I shouldn't get more because I was born lucky enough to be Picasso. Mm -hmm. See, now, not everybody's going to agree with that one, but mm -hmm. I think that's the case. I agree. What, what people should be remunerated for is effort and sacrifice, but that doesn't, it's not some narrow definition, but nor is it trying to find the scale of the con contribution. The idea is it's effort and sacrifice that's socially useful. So in this particular case, you're creating a community. The value that's being created is the art and presumably also the community um, and the connections and so on. And so if somebody is contributing to that, they are exerting effort that, that, benef you know, that, that augments that thing that you're trying to create. Well, that's the effort. If they do it under worse conditions, they should get more. If they do it more intensely, they should get more. And if they do it longer, they should get more. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the particular case in question, 
that means that it isn't just sitting in front of your tablet for a few hours, because if that was what it meant, and only that, then I could go in there and sit in front of my tablet for a few hours, produce nothing of any value at all to anybody, right? But get the same amount as somebody who is producing value. So it doesn't mean that. I can't pay the shortstop for the Yankees, no matter how hard I work at it. I'm not, good, <laughs> I'm not good enough. So you have to be able to produce what you're trying to produce. And you have to be competent at it. But how competent you are does not determine your income. Okay. I'm so sorry. We have to wrap up. Uh, I'm go we're going to answer, hopefully, your uh, wonderful questions, Umbrella. And I really want to thank all the panelists. Uh, and the, um, yeah. The and before we go, Michael, it's at 7 p.m. His case, keynote. So yeah, so, so that'll be a whole economic present. You know, what is a better economy and a good society? Yeah, awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>